This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. We will also explore threats to meaningful engagement in sport and movement culture practices and ask questions about what we can learn about the human condition through our involvement in sport. The guests are leading scholars in human and social sciences of sport who will share their explorations in a scholarly as well as a personal context. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog and access many resources for further explorations of Meaningful Sport. Today's episode is the second part of our discussions with Dr. Michael McDougall, and we focus on exploring the connections between culture and meaning. In the first part, which I recommend you to check out, we were asking questions such as, what kind of thing is culture? Can we create a winning culture, a healthy culture, or a meaningful culture around sport? Today, we will move our discussions to ideas about meaningful work and management of meaning, and their implications for sport. While it is very intuitive to think that aiming to create more meaningful work is a worthy goal of organizations, this so-called management of meaning can also be problematic in many levels. Our guests will ask us critical questions and challenge us to rethink the ethics around interventions aimed at culture change and meaningful work and also reflect on his own professional practice around these themes. Dr. Michael McDougall has completed his PhD focused on a critical examination of organizational culture research in sport at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK, and he currently teaches psychology at Keystone College in the US. He is conducting research on various topics, including cultures in sport and organizational contexts, meaningful work, craftsmanship, and well-being. And while his work is certainly critical and thought-provoking, he also engages in consultation work and puts his thinking into practice in organizational contexts. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Yeah, I think it would be really nice to now move on and and we can talk about meaningful work and and management of meaning. And so... uh, yeah, some of the work that we've done together in the last couple of years, we have looked into the concept of meaningful work and tried to think together how that can be applied in sport contexts. And and we stra- uh, started exploring that a bit together as well in empirical studies. And then something that you see in in the meaningful work literature is is that when we see all these benefits of meaningful work, that people are more satisfied with their jobs, they're more committed, their job performance goes up, all these all these good things and all these desirable things, then the next question is that how can we manage meaning? So how can we kind of increase meaningful work in our our workplace? And and with the critical work that you've done on organizational culture, you would right away see some issues there, some problems there that probably need to be addressed. So maybe we can start exploring and, and developing those ideas a bit together. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting thing, right? Because, I mean, it's so intuitive. If you could, and it goes back to some of the culture stuff, if you can help people have a better experience at work, why would you not help them try to have that? But it seems to be something happens in the process that as we try to help people have um, I don't know what you want to call it, like healthier cultures or have more meaningful experiences at work, that in that process of trying to make it happen, we we, we sort of, um, I guess, organisation and work becomes more bureaucratic 
and then we sort of stifle the very thing that we're trying to create. Um, so there's there's a paradox there for me, which you know I, I initially seen when I, I started getting into some of the the meaningful work literature. You know, it's so intuitively appealing that I would love to be able to help people to get these outcomes in their workplaces because it can help people uh, live better lives. They can be healthier. They can be less depressed at work and. <laughs> You know, one of the big things we have is if you look at the Gallup polls, people worldwide are completely disengaged from the work they do. So what a problem, right? What a problem that most of the workforce is uh, not actively engaged with the, the work they do. Um, so I understand that appeal, but it, it just seems to me that when you try and manage it in the way that we try and manage things uh, in the West and through Western managerialist perspectives, that something happens in that process where um, we lose sight of what we're trying to do and things become wrapped up in bureaucracy and organisation and socialisation and people to norms and uh, managerialism and, and all these things. And then we don't really get what we're trying to achieve. So it's a paradox, you know, I think it's, it's probably always working in tandem in some way. It was really interesting when you said that, you know, there is some data and, and some surveys about a lot of people uh, are actually very disengaged from their work. And so I haven't seen anything that comes to sport organizations. So I I don't know if you have seen anything about are the sports people who work in sport organizations, are they engaged? Are they finding meaning in their work? Or is it just something that we have no data of? To be at the quite honest, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um so the Gallup polls on engagement are you know, they run them every year and every year it's the same sort of results that it sort of comes back that people aren't actively engaged in the work that they do. Um, now, there's lots of critiques of those polls and how Gallup goes about it. Um, you know, and in some way, it's almost like um, consultants roll it out a lot. OK, so in the, the spaces I work in, consultants love to roll the statistic out. 75 percent of people worldwide aren't engaged with the work they do according to Gallup's recent poll. But here's the thing, I know how to do culture and I know how to do culture in a way that can help people become engaged. And, and, and that's what, you know, a little bit cynically, that's what a lot of consultants roll out. It's that model, you create the problem, but I have the solution. Um, so, so I'm not sure even if I, I completely trust the, the Gallup polls and the data. Um, but if, if we take the idea that people even if it's not completely correct, but lots of people aren't really engaged in the work they do, then that's a massive problem uh, because it ta attaches to lots of other issues, right? So the purpose people have in uh, their broader lives, the, the amount of stress they feel when they go to work, um, how depressed they might be or not be. It's also a problem for organisations because organisations worldwide struggle to uh, recruit people and then retain them and people are now more willing than ever to actually not just change jobs and workplace but actually change their vocational pathways so it's a the lack of engagement is a problem for both people and for organization um, now if the way that we did culture work which is the way we've sort of spoken about and we've critiqued which has been the dominant way of thinking about culture and organization and management consultancy since like like the early 1980s. If we were really doing culture very well, then why do you have so many people completely uh, disengaged? You know, there's something broken, right? If culture is this thing which is supposed to radically shift how people engage with their work and their work life, then why do we have this problem where, where worldwide people um, are not engaged with their work. So that's a sort of conundrum. Um, and I think what that means is um, we have to think not just about how we do culture differently, uh, but we have to think about organisation differently in general. So how can we have more inclusive practices? How can we be more bottom up? How can we get away from some of the damaging effects of managerialism, which uh, has its place, because it creates structure and order and it gives us targets and rules to follow. But if it was really working, then why does so many workplaces seem to be dysfunctional or not as effective as they could be? And, and that's, I suppose, a conundrum that I have by no means 
solved. But I just try and think in different ways how we can affect that wider problem. Uh, and the meaningful work stuff to come back to it, I guess, is is one part of that puzzle potentially. Yeah, I think to continue from there, like uh, the intuitive way that many people would think about people who work in sports, or let's say professional athletes, would be that uh, it's their childhood dream and, and it's kind of your dream job and your dream come true if you can make a living out of sport because sport is something mm-hmm. that you love. And uh, so intuitively it would be easy to think that athletes have like a really high level of meaningful work. But I think when you are talking from the organizational perspective and the management of meaning perspective, it reminds me of the work of Martin Roderick, who is talking about this rhetoric of vocation. And so when sport is kind of sold to young people as this is, if you make it, that's your dream come true. And that's the best that life can get. Then it's also... uh normalizing all the sacrifices and exploitation of athletes mm-hmm. and and all these really really problematic practices in elite sport you know like very low job security like you can be gone next year and and you can end up without this contract and and all the sacrifices in your personal life playing through pain and injury and all these things but you have to do because that's the vocation that's that's what you love and that's how it's set up in a in kind of a more yeah, cultural you know level. so I, I know there's literature that sort of suggests that um people who experience a lot of meaning uh, meaningfulness in their work uh, can be more easily exploited um because they're willing to sacrifice themselves their time uh, their bodies and their health for this thing that they think fulfills them or gives them greater purpose which you know might be completely acceptable to uh, the person you know they've they can certainly choose to engage with that and do that if they so choose but i think from an organizational level you have to also look at how that can become quite uh, but at least has a potential to become quite damaging right and I think that's something we definitely see in sport, uh, that that people with those who feel really vocationally attached to what they do can um, be pushed along a certain path where they think this is the only thing that gives them meaning. Um, And and maybe it is, but maybe it isn't. And and sport is a, a domain where lots of things happen. So I imagine, you know, it's very easy to feel that you're falling behind. It's very easy to feel that you're not doing good enough. It's very easy for it all to be over in an instant. So there's there's a dark side to meaning where if all your meaningfulness is derived from uh, one particular and subjective interpretation of what gives you meaning, i.e. I have to be this high-performing athlete, it, it can all change very quickly. And then we can end up in these situations where uh, athletes are... Uh, damaged or trying to transition outside of sport and finding that they don't really know what to do or who they are. So it's, again, it doesn't mean that meaningful work is a, a dark concept. It's just that sometimes when it's tacked on to managerialism, which has a history of exploiting people for the system and the greater good and uh, outcome functionality type mindset, that you know, it can be it can be misused much in the same way as culture can. I think now in the recent years, in the past couple of years, there has been a lot more work on the meaningful work being this double-edged sword that you can have all these benefits from from having meaningful work. You feel that you are making a positive difference. You feel that your work is something that is contributing to your personal growth. Uh, you are engaged, you are committed, you feel that it gives a lot, but you can also give to others through your work. But at the same time, if that's the only source of meaning in your life, just like you said, that ends up being a very fragile source of meaning. Who knows if you have your job next year, and especially if you're an athlete. Yeah, you know, and I, I think I think athletes, I mean, because we're talking in the sport context, uh like, like, absolutely, but, you know, you could potentially make the same case for PhD students, 
you know, like we're so wrapped up trying to complete a, a, a big book thesis over three, four or five years, however you're doing it. Um, and there's nothing necessarily to say that there's anything at the end of it. So, you know, there's, there's limited full time contracted positions, you know, out in the US where I work, there's a, a huge percentage of people spend an awful lot of money because education is extortionate in the US and they get to the end and there's actually not many tenure track positions. So people to stay in this and to stay in this thing that they think gives them all this purpose and all this meaning to what they do will accept adjunct and part-time positions, which doesn't come with health benefits. They're incredibly overworked. They're very insecure vocationally, especially in the current climate. But, you, you know, if you speak to them, it's, well, a lot of the time they don't know what else to do because of being in this sort of system and, uh, it maybe hasn't been discussed early enough and often enough that maybe there's nothing at the end of it uh, at all. You know, so that there's a problem now where there's just a, a bottleneck and there's very few PhDs out here get on the tenure track, but they haven't built up a lot of the times the skills or the networks to be able to go back out into industry to be able to do something else. Um, you know, and, and maybe recast mm. and reshape some of those meanings, i.e., I'm a, an academic into something else which might be uh, healthy. Like I'm an academic who uh, tries to solve applied problems and are there, I'm therefore valuable, not just in an academic setting, but also in applied worlds too. Uh, so that's like a, a subtle shift in meanings, um, which I think can be hugely beneficial to people trying to make sense of difficult scenarios. So, um, you know, how does that relate to sport? Well, well, maybe it's a case that there's nothing to say that you can't hold this meaning which you're going to be a high-performing athlete who does X, Y, and Z. But is there anything else you can furnish that meaning with? You know, and I, I think that's important to to add things, um, not just you know if that make if that makes sense. Um, we talked earlier about narratives. As n those are something that are very personal at the same time but, uh, and, and social at the same time. And so when we talk about personal meaning of being an athlete or being an academic, it's your meaning, but at the same time, it's, it's a cultural meaning that you pick up. So we don't create our meanings out of nowhere. So, for example, we can say that I love my sport, I love my work, and you probably sincerely feel yeah. that well at least sport maybe work yeah. too <laughs> well, well, absolutely. but uh but then on the other hand you know I was just thinking when I was interviewing doing some interviews with football coaches and in that culture there's a very strong cultural narrative about the love of the sport which is the animating force in everything that you do and that's that's why you are throwing away your all the other possible careers if you can just work in football because you love football and that's the best thing in the world so the personal meaning and how that ties into the cultural meanings and and the rhetoric of the sport culture like we have this really difficult kind of line like what is my meaning and what is our meaning and can you ever know the difference which one is authentically yours yeah it's and, and you know and, and that sort of interpretation, uh, in, you know again it's it's probably not fixed. You know it'll change as things happen. It'll change as events happen. Uh, it'll change as you change. And at least from where I'm coming from, it seems like people are always trying to make sense of their uh, individual narratives within these larger narratives, and both sort of inform the other potentially. Um, I think it's really important to sort of say, you know, that there's, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong um, with with any of these meanings we're discussing. You know, it's, it might be perfectly acceptable for a, a coach to say, this is my world, this is football. Uh, but because we're talking about culture uh, and that means people, we, we have to be aware that that's not the only meaning in play within a social context. And it's really easy in... Uh, context like sport to think that everybody in this uh, social context, this social environment, holds this meaning in the exact same way. Um, 
and, and it's actually much more layered than that. You know, it's a little bit like, um, so as an organisation just now, we are, I'll give you an example, we are discuss, discussing uh, racism within our our broader institution, okay? So you would hope that everybody in our organization is uh, anti-racist, okay? So that, that's the meaning that you would hope everyone would share. But if you burrow down into that, people will probably understand how you can be anti-racist in a multitude of different ways. So it can become very slippery if you just assume that because we all hold this meaning on a broad sort of generic level that uh, when you get into the layers, that it's still all sort of completely uniform. And, and, and that sort of takes us into the idea of the management of meaning too. It's uh, meaning yeah. ultimately uh, has to have this subjective, really highly personal element. And it's not ever completely fixed. You know, people fall out of love with the sport. People fall out of love with their job. People start to disengage from the people around them for a variety of reasons. Um, and then you can come back to some of that stuff and you're engaged again. Um, so it's complex. And I just think if we don't really recognise that complexity, we end up in a situation where we, we think we can manage people's meanings. And I, I suppose it's aspirationally, I can understand why we'd want to do that. But in practice, it seems like... Uh, a little bit of a ridiculous notion and also something that could lead you into ethically questionable um, practices too. Um, so, so, so that's the sort of sharp end. That's the sharp end for me is like, how do you shape the environment while not uh, subjugating people to forms of managerial control? Yeah, I was thinking that you know, as as researchers, for example, when we are writing grant applications and then we are saying that these are all the wonderful practical significances of our project and this is going to be the impact. And so aren't we all in some ways managers of yeah. meaning? Like we want people to have more enjoyment in sport or more meaning in sport or whatever so if we are if we want to be if the end goal is kind of having more people involved then you want them to have a better experience and then you want to be managing the meaning of that experience so that then these people come back to sport yeah. so isn't that actually something that a lot of us are doing all the time at least when we are building up the reason why you should give me the money to do this research in the first yeah place. <laughs> absolutely and also you know it's something that happens uh, not just in terms of grants but in terms of the research that we do and it gets out there because i understand that although i'm saying we have to be very careful with how we manage meaning is that give you a different understanding and interpretation of culture and some of the other things we can do with it I'm also potentially trying to manage people's meanings. So, and, and that happens when you're on the ground doing practice as well. And I, I was a manager for a long time in, in an organization and I've worked at least a little bit as a consultant. And I'm very, very aware of my role within that, that even as I am trying to broaden people's understanding of culture and what you can do with it, I, I am in a sense uh, managing uh, people's meanings. And then that can have an effect too. So it's it's a conundrum, you know, and I, I went for like a couple of years where I thought, well, I can't do anything, you know, because it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's like the, know. it's like, you know, the uh, the butterfly effect. As soon as I become involved, people can take my ideas and I don't know how they're going to be used. And it might not necessarily be used to do something that I agree with or think is good. But in a sense, it's not really for me to manage that or say that either. Um which mean, doesn't mean that I'm completely absolved from what I do. I still think as practitioners, we have to be very mindful uh, that all, like, so for example, all culture change or all change are in a sense projects of power. And I don't think we're absolved from that. You know, we're not politically neutral. Um, when people take our ideas, they may use them in a multitude of ways. And I've heard many consultants say, well, hey, look, it's not my problem. I give them the information. I give them the resources to do this better. And it's kind of up to them how they do it. I, I don't really fully buy into that. You know, it makes sense in terms of getting in places and making money. But we can't just become hired guns who are, in a sense, 
telling the locals what to believe and uh, what meanings they should hold and keep as important. We have to recognise our role in that too. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're no, we're we're not really that removed from the colonisers, you know, and, and we'll find ourselves as a profession in ten years really question our part in some questionable practices. But it's difficult, you know, it's difficult. So if you actually want to do practical work, uh, which I do, I don't, you know, I don't just do research. I'm constantly involved in this sort of internal dialogue where I am trying to shape things, but also conscious of the nefarious uh, consequences of those uh, actions as well. And it is hard, you know, it's really hard. Uh, I generally did go through a couple of years where uh, I really thought about throwing in the towel and didn't think I could do anything practical with the concept of culture as I saw it. Um, and I, I, I kind of, yeah. I've, I've sort of came through that for various reasons as I try to practicalize some of the, these thinkings. But it's, but it is difficult and where you're 100% right that we are also actively all the time engaged in uh, shaping the meanings that people derive from like a whole host of situations as researchers and as practitioners. Yeah. We definitely are. And and then we come to the questions of ethics. And I think in a practical level, we don't think that all the values are equally good. But we, we do believe that kind of certain cultures in sport and in work are probably better than some others. And we do want to, when we are practically involved in the world, we do want to be working towards causes that we actually believe in. And so we cannot just be problematizing everything and sitting back and, hey, I'm not <laughs> going to be involved because we are all practically involved in the world every day and we are making these ethical decisions. It, exactly. And, and, and that gets to, you know, a lot of my uh, research is informed by critical scholarship, both in sort of social theory and uh, critical management scholars. And that's a critique of of those types of scholars that they're, you know, they're, they're excellent in their critiques. They can deconstruct ideas and challenge some of her base assumptions. But there's a point where you have to question, are they just destined to um, deconstruct and destroy, but never to build? And, and that's, a, that's a genuine critique that's been leveled at some of the most well-known critical management scholars. Now, in a sense, they can afford to do that if they are just purely in the academic realm. They can just make a, a career based on critiques of all their base assumptions about management and organisation. Why is the leader automatically the person with the moral authority to make decisions? Are we sure that's the best way to do it? Uh, can bottom-up practices work if you have leadership sponsorship? These are the sort of questions they ask. But a critique is that, well, what do you do with some of that understanding? And many of them have tried to engage a little bit, and many of them haven't. But as someone who works also in practice and who tries to do applied work, I don't really have the luxury of just um, staying on the academic side of things and saying, well, I'm just pointing out the flaws in the thinking. So I have to try and think through some of these issues that we're talking about to see how it works on the ground. So if I start off saying, well, hey, actually, I don't think the leader is... Uh, the moral arbiter of the culture, although I can recognise that they maybe have more influence over certain things. So what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that actually there's a lot culturally that they don't know and they should really go and find out about. And then I've maybe got to work with them to see what they would do with that understanding. And then maybe we can do something like, well, let's not try and control people uh, in the way that we've maybe done in the past. And let's socialise people and think that's the end point. But maybe there's a way we can come at this a little bit differently. So can we set some sort of structures which gives people, I don't know, like more autonomy? Or can we set relationships which mentor people better? So there's things that you can do which sort of shifts it a little bit. But it's always this back and forth dialogue, I think. And I think if you can have that internally and... Uh, still remain humble, I think you can still do some really valuable work because, you know, culture at the end of the day, um, even at the, the level of meaning we're talking about, it transforms the world. You know, it, there's an old adage that um, 
social transformation is nothing without cultural transformation. And, and I think that's really true. So if the world can be made, then you can unmake it and perhaps remake it in better ways. Uh, but it involves thinking, at least for me, all these sorts of things that we're batting about. Um, what can we do? What's the limits of what we can do? Where does the theory, where does the theoretical rigor become compromised by the practice that I'm trying to apply? Uh, is this theory really practical and how can I mend it in a way which protects its credibility but can still make practical change? Um, all these sorts of things I think we can do. And if you have people who are both researchers and practitioners, it creates this like really exciting space where you can have these conversations and do this type of work, all centered around um, meanings, meanings in the workplace, uh, meanings in sport and in organizational life. So yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly very mm. exciting, but it does create some personal conundrums uh, where I've really got to think about what I'm doing. Yeah, I think I was going to be asking about what could be the more ethical ways of of engaging with this work, but I think you already kind of summarized it really well. So I think some of the things to take from this discussion is that we probably agree that we we share this aspiration and ambition that if we can help people to live more meaningful lives in their workplace and, and have a more meaningful experience in sport, those would be some goals that we both agree that are quite worthy goals. And and a lot of people working in sport are obviously striving uh, for these kind of goals. But before we go on and, and do our stuff, we always have to be recognizing that there is this power relation and we are going there in a way, uh, having these ideas that we know better. This is the kind of, if you do this and that, that's the way that you are going to have a more meaningful experience. And and there is always this big danger that we should not always assume that our meaning is the better meaning. And 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 we know how how to do that because that's then colonizing uh, the other others' life. Yeah, world. I think that's like a really excellent summary and. You know, it takes us back to that earlier point that we've made culture this blunt instrument of performance, um, something that acts to maintain the cohesion of the, the social whole. But, you know, the, the reorientation towards meaning sort of says that, well, it's, it's, it's never been that integrated and uh, crystallized through consensus. It's always shifting. It's always dynamic, which isn't to say that there's not some things that don't last over time. Uh, in the form of structures and rules and um, systems. It's because there's definitely meanings that people can hold which sort of last. But just be aware that, you know, that people don't just exist in an organisation to serve the purpose of the system. You know, that that's a sort of functional, structural functionalist position. And if we're really going to take things like agency and power seriously, we have to build that into our cultural thinking too, which some of the systems thinking, uh, the structural functionalist position, didn't really sort of do. It's just the idea that people are just absorbed into the system and uh, through what they do and the roles they fulfill, help to maintain it. So, you know, we've sort of spoken. It's, it's never, re I don't really see social life like that. It's always people who are vulnerable, anagenic and powerful and intentional uh, within a local context with local meanings and some sort of shared understandings, which might change over time, but which might be contested in some ways, not uniformly understood in others, which might be uncertain. And all of that is usually happening within larger events because culture isn't a closed system, which is how we often treat it in organisations. It's just this bounded entity. And you know, the anthropologists sort of really showed that it wasn't because as soon as we get into this globalized world and people move across the globe, you have mul multiple cultural touching points. So in any sort of environment, no matter how closed it seems, you have multiple things going on, which usually means that meanings are layered and deep and require uh, a really serious attempt to interpret what is going on and how people uh, understand their worlds and what they think is going on. Uh, so that's 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 difficult. Um, 
but I, I guess, you know, I think your summary really did sort of touch on a lot of points, but it just takes us back to that idea that culture isn't just this blunt instrument of performance. It's a way to sensitize us to different worldviews, to help us to work out what we have in common and to then help us have conversations across cultural lines. And if you can think of culture like that, I think you can actually start doing lots of really, really good work because then you start to see all of the social world as informed by meaning and layered meanings and you can analyse and interpret that and understand it better. Which I think if you really make a serious attempt to do that, leads you to more ethical and actually more practical practices as well. Um, because if you can achieve deeper understanding, I think that can inform a lot of action and what you then go on to do. So it's, it's for me, you know, this culture as meaning opens up uh, a lot of opportunities, uh, not just for researchers, but also for people trying to uh, apply some of that thinking as well. Yeah, what you said earlier, that kind of what triggered me when you said about culture and, and meaning being intertwined and how that's always the person's life history and all these different experiences and how the meanings are unique in different sport cultures and in dif different sport organizations. So it came to my mind that I think one of the dangerous points where we are at in, in meaningful work literature might be that now that there is quite a lot of literature, now we might think that we we have figured out what mm. it is and how you can produce that. Because it's quite consistently that there will be two or three factors, you know, that you you need to do A, B, and C. Like, you know, you need to create bonds between between people and you have to crystallize how this how this work is making the world a better place and these kind of things. So that kind of uh really quickly brings uh comes back to that functionalist perspective that yeah now we know if we are manipulating variable a and b and c that means that after that we will have people working here who have a more meaningful work experience and and then we get all the benefits that come with yeah. it so i think for sport culture as well and if we try to understand meaningful experiences in sport that's that's a dangerous point that we shouldn't think we know what is meaningful for people and not try to get down to maybe three variables that everybody can then manipulate after that and then we kind of solve the 100%. You know, it's, it's that idea that, you know, culture is almost like the, the missing piece. You know, if we can work out how to get this culture by doing X, Y and Z and we can just manipulate, we'll get it. But... You know, what I see in my head as you sort of spoke about that is leaders pulling levers that they think are cultural, then actually something else happens somewhere else in the system uh, that was unanticipated or what they expect to happen doesn't happen or or they think it happens for a short time and then the the organisation or the group of people come under some sort of stress and then it all kind of ruptures and explodes and it's it hasn't happened in the way that they they thought and the culture wasn't as consistent and as solid as they has had perhaps thought um and, and that's you know it's certainly in the meaningful work literature i think that is something that the certainly the psychologists are trying to do you know let's objectify meaningful work and kind of ignore some of the older philosophical perhaps like existential arguments. Uh, let's get down to th three or four things that we can do, then we'll put it into the workplace and this will happen. Um, and it's, it's for me, it's just, um, it's a little bit of a holy grail. You know, it's, it's, it's great aspirationally, but is it really going to happen uh, when it all comes together? And is evidence so far, because it's, meaningful work is just, the latest thing that psychologists have tried to do in the workplace, right? There's uh, before that it was maybe like satisfaction, and then it was engagement, and then it was work purpose, and then it was something else. So they're always trying to distill down to like three or four things. Uh, but I think what the anthropologists and the sociologists really know is that the system is always much more complex than that. So in action, it means that these three or four things that you think you can enact, it doesn't always have the desired consequences that you want. Um, now, fused to organisational culture and culture change, 
Uh, that is something we've certainly seen because there's this myth that culture just changes wholesale. So if I go in with the old concept of culture that we've described and critiqued, um, I can distill down to three or four things that absolutely say how this group is within their bounded parameters. And that's them. It makes them unique. It makes them unlike anyone else. Um, well, what do we like about that? What don't we like about that? Well, we don't like this. Let's change that and we'll get in these new sets of values and then we'll uh, we'll socialise people so they hold those values, then we'll get it into behaviour and we'll reward good behaviour, we'll punish bad behaviour and then hey presto, we have something like the culture we wanted. Um, you know, I think that's really fictional because although I've said culture is fluid and meanings shift, some meanings are really deep and layered through an organization's history or woven through people's personal identity. So they're not readily given up, even under demands of authority. Um, and I think that's when you run into some of these issues where leaders think they have a very good plan for a future culture and they, uh, I think they identify what it is and they try and change it and they think they've changed it only to be met with resistance at some point and then they're surprised um, when in fact they just didn't really understand how people so saw the world differently in the first place. Um, and, and that's partly, you know, it's, I've spoken about psychologists doing it. Organisational management scholars, mainstream management have certainly tried that approach. But But really I think, you know, it's it's part of this like uh, enlightenment type thinking that will uh, will absolutely get to know the world through science and reason and rational progress. Uh, when in fact, many, many of the good thinkers that I admire and like in philosophy have warned of the dangers of that way of thinking, um, that new isn't necessarily always good or better. So there's an important point for culture change is the new version of what you think absolutely better than what you've got? Because maybe there's some things in your current culture that you quite like, or at least other people within the organisation might like and want to keep. So then you get into a space where we're not really talking about culture as this like um, complex whole thing that can be easily shifted in a wholesale absolute way, but you're really talking about renewal or... Um, or incremental change, or um, as opposed to something that's wholesale and absolute, which just seems like a little bit unrealistic to me. Um, and I think those thinking through those kinds of things can lead you to better practices where you might also think about what you want to preserve uh, as culturally important, not just what you want to change, um, which is certainly to me ties into the anthropological notion of culture that is tied to history and customs and rituals that have been formed and woven through time and place and passed on through generations. That might be a really nice point to round up to, that if we are thinking of meaningful work in sport and meaningful experience in sport, we probably shouldn't be aspiring to do a complete, some kind of... Uh, culture change for meaning that you know tomorrow we are going to have a meaningful sport culture but actually if you are starting to do this kind of top-down reform whether it's a sport club or physical education or whatever it is you might be actually destroying or marginalizing some aspects of the culture that have actually been very meaningful for these people yeah that that's that's the danger and it can i, I can definitely see it as like you know there's things that perhaps make that we might think would make sport meaningful, uh, so, but but maybe in doing that, will unintentionally marginalise the the ways that people, some groups of people, uh, derive their meanings just now. So a good starting point for me is instead of thinking what would a meaningful sport culture be, uh, is to recognise that it's probably different across different groups and in different places in the world, and. Uh, that it'll be different for different groups of people within those groups and it'll be different within individuals within those groups within the groups. So maybe we need to work out uh, first what sort of meanings people hold uh, before we start trying to change things. And certainly as a, a consultant, uh, trying to work that out before I rush ahead and do things 
uh, has been a, a, a very important step in the, the process. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm just hoping that the listener doesn't go away feeling like completely paralyzed. Oh my God. Like, just like you said that you, a couple of years you felt that you cannot do anything with culture without feeling that you're a colonizer and kind of uh, marginalizing people's meanings and their cultures by bringing in your, your ideas. But so I hope our message also comes through that meaning is embedded in the culture it it's something that is diverse it changes over time but there are also this uh, kind of strands of meaning that come with the long tradition long history long culture around the sport and, and some of these things that people really value and and they want to preserve in sport yeah as well. um, i mean i mean absolutely uh, uh, i mean pr- probably just as uh, just to add to that I sort of maybe a little bit meanly, like maybe a little bit directly. I hope in some ways people are a little bit paralysed because it means that they will think it through a little bit more uh, and start to see culture as maybe something different from just this instrumental thing. Uh, but I would offer encouragement that there's there's many uh, different starting points um, that, you know, if, if you think of culture as also historical and it's been formed through time, it means that you spend a little bit more time thinking about where you've been uh, to work out where you want to go. That seems like really practical. Um, if you think of culture not just as shared in terms of consensus and uniformity, but also what is contested and what might be not understood, that is a really great and easy heuristic just to add to your current understanding of culture. Uh, it's really practical. It's like having a flashlight uh, or a torch, as you would say in the UK. Um, you know, if, if, if you just have one beam and it's like you're a shared lens, everything's uniform and consensus, like the beam is a little bit weaker. But if you can add in that culture may also be what is contested and a little bit different, it, it makes your, your beam a little bit more powerful. And then if you add in that some things are always in flux, you get a stronger beam again. So it's a little simple heuristic, but it makes it uh, deeply practical. Um, if you think that culture just isn't the domain of leaders, although we can still recognise that they are often very influential, it can help you have more bottom-up practices. If you think culture is fluid, uh, it means that you don't try and concretize it in a set of absolute final behaviours where you say, this is our culture. Um, and I guess all of this where it becomes really practical for me is that I really think culture as meaning, as it was spoken about by people in anthropology like Geertz, um, people in cultural sports psychology do a very good job of speaking about meaning too. I, I think it can give you a different lens of analysis, which can allow you to do different types of work too. So for me, it's becoming deeply practical. But um, so I, I guess to round off is that uh, I hope people are a little bit paralysed, but also encouraged and aspirational with it too, that you, you can still do work in this space and, and do positive things, which we're all ultimately trying to do, I think. Yeah, I think that's that's a wonderful finish for our talk today. So thanks so much, Michael, for, for sharing. No, thank ideas. you for inviting me on and lis- listening to me uh waffle on about culture for uh, a good a good hour or so now. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcast or whichever app you use. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.